The, the, the major issue that we try to raise in, in this chapter of, of the book is basically how uh, historically price volatility has increased over time. Uh, what we show there is that between January 2001 and December 2006, there were in average per year around 26 events of uh, extreme price volatility, which means to us is a high frequency of periods in which the returns are extremely high, abnormal, 5% uh, of probability of them happening. And if we compare that 26 in average uh, per year to what happened between 2007 and 2011, January 2007 to December 2011, the number increased to around 76 uh, days per year of excessive uh, price volatility. And that's a significant change in difference to the price levels, which although they increased and there were spikes, uh, they were not historically high. The volatility is becoming historically high. And that's why we observe the change between 26 in average to 76. Uh, and that uh, completely changed the paradigm of what we need to do to try to, to minimize the risks on food security. Because price volatility affects both producers uh, because they don't know what to expect and they don't know exactly how to invest. But also affects consumers because most of the poor people are net producers and net consumers. So they will produce and consume. And their income will be affected on the production side and that will also affect what they consume. And as a result of that, uh, many policies were trying to be brought up in the G20 meetings of the Paris G20. Uh, the problem of many of them is that they, they could create more distortions in the market. Uh, and what the chapter tries to do is try to look across the different uh, recommendations and try to see which ones uh, really uh, could make more sense uh, in the current environment and which ones could really be targeted to reduce the problem of volatility we are facing. There are three key reasons that, that uh, we point out in, in the report that are behind this uh, excessive volatility. One of those is the fact that the portfolio of food is highly concentrated. So when we look at, at rice, wheat, soybeans uh, and corn, uh, the top five countries, basically exporting countries, are the ones that manage or control most of the exports of the world. So anything that happens to any of these countries will automatically affect uh, prices in the world, international prices. So one of the key challenges is how we find ways in which we can increase this portfolio, diversify this portfolio, so that we have more exporting countries around the world, so that we are not uh, restrictive in the sense that if something one thing happens in one of these countries, the global prices will be affected. And that is one of the focus of the G20 in Mexico that is happening this year, is to try to find ways to increase uh, productivity, agricultural productivity, but in a sustainable way, and also targeting smallholders. And it's also a focus of, of the Business 20, which is the B20 group that is being uh, going to meet in, in Mexico this year. So that's one core challenge and one of the structural causes behind that I think requires investment in agriculture and requires creating a, a, an increase in, in yields, but in a sustainable way. The second element which is important is the low level of stocks that we have. Uh, the global stocks uh, were in, a, in, in, in one of the lowest levels. The stock to use ratio is in historical low levels. And that, of course, is always correlated with spikes and, and volatility. So one option is to try to figure out which are the appropriate policies to be able to resolve this problem. We know that country level stocks won't resolve the problem. Uh, they will especially could have certain several biases and there are several studies that have looked at that, especially if they are used as buffer stocks. So clearly that's not the option to go uh, and we need to carefully assess that and avoid countries to take policies that we know in the past have not worked. Now using minimum stocks uh, to link them to the safety nets of the country, that's an option where we can move forward because basically that will help to secure the access of food in the, in the periods of a crisis. Now, the options that are being elaborated and that are being tested, one is that came from the Paris G20, is a regional reserve to be tested in ECOWAS in West Africa. And also there is experience of the Asian Plus Free, which is trying also to build a regional reserve. The key points behind those uh, and the key challenges is how to identify the optimal trigger and how to minimize the cost of handling those reserves and the political economy, of course, of coordinating the delivery of the process and linking it to the safety nets to avoid uh, problems of uh, um, uh, interventions in the market that could distort markets. So trigger and linking to safety nets is crucial and both of them have that behind. And that's also something that countries can learn, but, but it's, 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 it's a challenge that we need to be very careful uh, um, to analyze previous history and what has happened in the past uh, with this type of policies. And the third component is linked to, to, to the biofuel market uh, and how uh, we can start moving to a new scenario or in which we can move into more flexible mandates, but smart flexible mandates in the sense that they are related to periods of excessive volatility. So whenever we are facing a period of extreme uh, volatility, 
then it makes sense that a flexible mandate activates because countries which are key exporters won't substitute the use of grains towards biofuel instead of food. So that will help to resolve the problem that we are facing today in terms of the significant increase in the share of, of consumption of corn uh, for biofuels, especially in the US and, uh, and Europe. So assessing and trying to understand better how good uh, mechanisms of flexible mandates can be implemented is another challenge that, that we need to look at it. So those are the two. And then, of course, uh, the third component is, is to follow up the recommendations that came in the action plan of the G20 in Paris. And that's one of the roles of the G20 in Mexico is to see what has been done uh, and what has worked, what has not, and also to start to, to push forward to more medium and long-term actions towards productivity in a sustainable way. I, I hope the, the, the idea and the impact of the report is to make people aware of the problems that we are facing and the concerns, and that uh, although today we are facing more stable prices, and we are not observing the spikes we observed in the last uh, years, uh, clearly the problem is not resolved and it's something that we need to take very seriously uh, and it's something that uh, it's important that uh, people and policymakers realize of, of, of the importance of this issue and, and it's not a short-term issue. Uh, the structural problems have not been resolved uh, and there is a lot of work to be done uh, to try to do this. So. It's, a, it's, an, it's an issue that needs to be taken very seriously over time and it's not uh, because the prices are stable today doesn't mean that this couldn't happen tomorrow.